Hello, everybody. This is Mike Pucciarelli, owner of Cellular Photography of Mike Pucciarelli YouTube channel. And tonight I'll be talking about, you know, light painting and some new tools and techniques I'll be using. And this will be recorded and I will post a recording sometime this week so you can view it for a replay. I just first want to give an introduction to who I am. My name is Mike Pucciarelli. I started a professional photography around 2010, 2011. Graduated from McGillivray College in 2013. 2015, you know, I joined Professional Photographers America. I was so amazed by all the business resources. I listed many of those. And then 2017 and later, I joined some of the um, affiliate clubs. And I also, you know, attended imaging at 2019. And 2020, and I learned a lot with imaging. I've learned a lot with the resources, and I met a lot of interesting people. In 2021, I received my craftsman degree during a virtual ceremony, and then 2022 of July, that's when I received my CPP, <coughs> my Certification of Professional Photographers of America. <coughs> so. You know, light painting is a journey. I'm still learning things, and so a lot of other people. <clears throat> so, we have an agenda for tonight where, <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking about light painting information and techniques. Now we do some illustration of equipments, retail and homemade, have some uh, diagrams of information. Some of them are, you know, lead light stroke diagrams. And then I have Adobe, Ad, Adobe Camera Raw, a, a demo, Adobe Photoshop. <coughs> and then maybe I probably have enough time for a screenshot demo. And if you have any questions, you can just stop me. You could send a message to the tat and you know, his email at mputrelliart2016 at gmail.com. First one to display my portfolio. My latest light painting. I'll talk about this tonight. Talk about this one. Maybe this one. And these are some, you know, I took a trip to with other people, American Society of Photographers. This is in Hawken Hill State Park. <clears throat> the bridge near the hotel. <clears throat> this is a good waterfall. Glad you, uh, so glad you, <clears throat> somebody's joining us. This is being recorded, so you'll have to see the replay. This is a waterfall of Hawkins Hill State Park. Another waterfall. <clears throat> this is Brookside Gardens in Weed, Maryland. I like the reflections early in the morning. This is another light painting. This is an older one, but we'll talk about the first three tonight. Another light painting. The black plexiglass reflection. Another black plexiglass reflection. This is a bridge in Italy near the Vatican, where part of a bigger trip. And this is the bigger part of the trip where I was with someone else photographing models. This is in Tuscany. The other, this is in Rome. This Capitol Columns. This is in the Great, you know, Arboretum in Washington D.C. These are trees. This Arboretum has plenty of um trees, plenty of colorful trees. There's an eagle going in opposite directions in the Conewingo Dam. It's another eagle.
So um, there are some modifiers that you should use to help you light paint. And this is basically to soften the lead light or lead flashlight. And you know, recommend, you know, the big thing is the plastic fusion scrims or the white scrims. This is great for making the light softer, especially if a powerful light and want to sprinkle some light on the top, you definitely want to use like a white scrim reflector. And then there's white cards, silver cards, or black cards. You can also do silver cards too, like do an initial blank exposure. If you want to just put some light in the shadow, use a silver card. But then when you light paint an hour later when it's dark, you don't need that silver card because you're just, that's when the light painting begins, <clears throat> the flash lead light part. Then you can use Cinefill for a great, you know, you can create a filter for softening the light. You can put duct tape to attach it. You could also use clothespins or, you know, small spring clamps. And tonight we're talking a lot about, you know, foil filters. Some people use the Harold Ross adapter, but I like to use fill filters. I like to invent my own tools where I talk about how you can use it with a simple tool like a hat salt and a duct tape. And it's a simple thing to create. It's not expensive, it's cheap. You can buy, you know, the plastic PCB pipe at any hardware store. And duct tape they use a lot because you can create a tiny slit snoop for like a small, you know, flashlight, that flashlight to soften the light. And you can purchase, you know, all this online. You can you can purchase a lot of this at an art store like Plaza Arts or a hardware store at Home Depot. So there's a lot of things you can do to help you soften the light and get the effect that you like. <clears throat> this is what my light painting environment could look like. Um, you have a big, you know, white screen reflector here. So if I were to drag a powerful LED light, you want to have it, you have the scrim in front to soften the light. And the same thing over here. And sometimes I just use like a foil filter and just a LED flashlight, a small one, and I focus on the objects. I'll talk about that later. So you definitely want to use something, you know, to soften the light, either, you know, a white scrim reflector or a filter, a foil filter you created out of a PCP pipe at a hardware store. And they really help, you know, soften the lead light. And I'll talk about the filters and, you know, lead flashlights and lead lights that I use coming up. This is a powerful lead light called, you know, the Godex lighting stick. And the many ways you can use this, you could use this to light paint something big. You can also light paint something small, like a background of like a still life. And I use this a lot where I put it on a pole and I close the barn doors to make the light more narrow. And then I turn on the light and then I turn this on. And then I control it with this. And all you have to do is push the on button. You can turn it on and off, but you have to turn it on first. But this lighting, Godox lighting stick, can be used in many ways. And I use it to light paint my background. I also light paint my car, but I, let, I do a lot more still life than light painting cars because you know, light painting a car, I like to do it outside. And, you know, you can't do it in the rain and you shouldn't do it in the wind. There's, there's a lot of factors that could stop me from light painting a car outside. But I recommend, you know, the lighting, Godax lighting stick for background and also light painting a car. This is another powerful LED light. I was at a studio where I was light painting a motorcycle and I was experimenting and I, I like using the diffusion stock to soften the light. And I usually use it with a plug. It also has a car charger, but I don't always use this, but the plug that comes with it. And the light is balanced to 56K and the power is composed over 600 LEDs. And you can use a VMON battery, but you have to purchase that separately. But everything you see here comes with the kit. And this is a great light. It's a powerful light. And you also have like a on the back, you control the power of the LED light. 
But I always like to use it full power. And use it with like a snoot stock to get the effect that I like. This is another lead light. It's a powerful one, but not powerful as the preceding slide. But you have a 216 lead lamps, and the light is balanced at 56K. And like the other light, it has a power dimmer for controlling the light. And it has two kinds of power supply. Either you could, you know, you have to purchase it separately. You have to put the battery separately, but they both work well. But this is a great light if you want to light paint something big or a small part of something big. You can also, you know, I could also light paint a bike in my place. And I recommend that you put on the top thing here, the fil clear filter, so you soften the light. And it also comes with barn doors where if you want to light paint something narrow, you want to close it. But if you want something big, then you open them. So this is another light that I sometimes use. And I never use these other gel filters because I don't want to affect the color of the light. I just want to use a clear, natural lead you know, color to make it look natural. This is another powerful lead light. And this is great for light painting a car. And it, the battery contains a lot of electricity, but make sure you can use it, make sure it works, and you want to make sure you charge it up. And it comes with a car charger. It also comes with the batteries inside. So you just charge it up with this charger here. And this cable, you can use any type of um, USB charger for this, but it comes, you know, this all comes in the same kit. You can buy something like this at, you know, Home Depot or Lowe's. This is great for if you want to light paint like a wheel of a car. And I recommend that, hey, you try with the white restroom reflector and without. This is a new light where it's average 204, it's great, it has 204 LEDs. It has a flexible color temperature range. You can adjust the temperature from 3200K to 5600K. It's a flexible power control and it has an AC adapter, battery charger, and it comes with the L series type battery. And when you get this light, make sure you use the battery that comes with it. Don't use a bigger battery or it may not work right. That's what I'm going by the directions. And it helps to read the directions that I do just to make sure you understand all this. This is a powerful light if you want to like sprinkle light on top of the subject where you have a scrim for softening light. There's another LED flashlight. You can buy this. I bought this at a computer store at Micro Center. And it comes with the AC adapter like the other one, LC's type battery, but this battery is not as big as the other. So like I said, when you buy a LED flashlight, it comes with the battery, use the battery that that it comes in with it. And like the other one has a shoe mount where you could use with a 3H stud stand. You have flexible color temperature between 32K to 56K. And you have a flexible power control. And I recommend that you use this LED light with a wire reflective scrim. Sometimes, you know, since it's such a powerful light, there was a light painting where there wasn't enough light, so I decided to start all over. It was really dark, and when you turn this on, you aim it at the wall, you can have a nice vignetting effect, and that's great for adding impact in a photograph. This is, so this light, like the other light in the preceding slide, can be used in many ways. And these are what I call foil filters, where they're just PCP pipes you can buy at a hardware store. They're like the L series. So I buy two of these and on one of the L's pipes, I just do use a hacksaw and I just make a 45 degree slant. And so basically 
the diameter of this will match the diameter of the lead flashlight. And so, you know, I'll talk about when you use it with the filter without a filter, you change the light. And tonight I'm also gonna talk about filters. I mean, not filters, I mean presets. But these, you know, just you just use duct tape. And all you have to do is stick that lead flashlight inside. And it makes, you know, light painting easier. You control your light and you could paint better with, you know, with the filters. And you know, some people, you know, use the Harold Ross adapter, but that's fine. I want to use my own thing, but I'm sort of doing the same thing where you're just trying to just stick the lead flashlight inside. And I'll talk about that next or coming up. Yeah. So now, you know, technology changing, so is the information. And all you have to do is you put the lead flashlight in the foil filter. And when you turn on the light, it makes a big difference. Now, in terms of the color adjustment, color balance, you can do two things. You can use a new gray card for every new kind of light, or now it's even easier. You can use a preset in Adobe Camera Raw for every time. So this would be one preset. Without the filter, it'd be another preset. And I'll talk about how I do it with with a name it. So I use a certain, you know, lead light with the filter, they'll be defined in a preset already. So when you want to, when you light paint, you want to, I'll talk about the diagram. You want to really think of the edges of your shape. You want to think of your texture. And of course, you want to make sure you shoot with the full battery. You want to make sure all your lead flashlights work. And you have fresh batteries with the lead flashlights. I have an extra set of fresh batteries, you know, for both the camera and the LED flashlights. And I always recommend shooting with a full battery on the camera. You know, some people, they leave the camera on for three or four hours. I only leave my camera on maybe for an hour. And you know, maybe half hour because I have to add in light with the big lighting wand. And I always recommend either you know, for the hold the camera still, I'd recommend either a cable release or a wired remote. I've been using a wired remote and experimenting with the R6. That's a great camera, and that camera's working great. See what the LED lights look when you put in a filter. The light's softer, maybe a little harsh here. But, you know, you have an easier time, you know, light painting a properly exposed image with the filters and without. You got a lot of lead light coming out of that um, lead flashlight or light. And so I recommend a scrim or a filter. And to help your light painting improve, you think like a painter and, you, you know, you'll feel differently. You'll, light, you'll use the you know, lead lights differently. <clears throat> so I'm going to check the chat if there are any questions. I don't think they are. Okay. So these are with the LED lights with no filters, where you know it's hard to light is. And in terms of you know softening the light, controlling the light, light painting, it's always better to use a filter or a screen because you'll have flattering light, you'll control the exposure. And these are my cases. Now I just have my lead flashlights and I have my foil filters in like a nylon bag. These cases are great. You can buy them in a computer store, maybe a hardware store. And they're three times less expensive than the other camera cases, but doing some research, a lot of this stuff is coming down in price. These cases are very sturdy and they're tough. They're easy to work with and they're small, they're compact. And I like using them and I still use them today. These are my LED flashlights where a lot of times I use the power flashlight or the coast. And 
a lot of times there's a filter on this flashlight, LED flashlight, so you don't have an overexposed image. Sometimes you can use a smaller LED flashlight, like the small police one here. It's about 50 lumens, but if you take away a filter and you just think about the image, you could paint a halfway decent exposure frame for part of a bigger image. And you could do the same thing with all these uh, LED flashlights where, you know, a small LED flashlight is between maybe 50 and 200 lumens. A uh, big one, it's between 2,000 to 3,000 lumens. So, you know, what are you trying to light paint? The light painting something shiny? And you want to definitely put a scrim or a filter because you'll have that glare and you probably don't want that in the photograph. These are all my fill filters and they fit any type of LED flashlight that I, you know, have where in the foil filter, you just measure the diameter of the flashlight. You go to the hardware store and you measure the diameter of the PCV pipe and it'll fit. And then, and since it's using duct tape for some of this, you just cut a 40 frame angle slant and you connect the other part with um, duct tape. And I recommend duct tape because it's staying on there. Some people, you, you could use construction tape, but I just, I like duct tape better because it's tougher and works well. And again, you could buy any major or even a small hardware store, you know, like Ace and Chincoteague, where I bought the PCV pipe. It was a reasonably priced item, but there's some other stuff there that I thought was just way too expensive. So I decided not to buy that other stuff. I can't remember exactly what it was, but they had a good, you know, PCP pipe selections. Now, this is what I'm going to be talking about the preset where power with filter, which means I will light a gray card with a foil filter. Without means with no filter. And so everything on the right here is with either a scrim or a filter. And everything on the right, left here, I get my right and left mixed up. Everything on the right is without a filter. And so if you lie paint with the scrim and the barn doors are open with the Godox lighting spit, you want to use this preset. And if it's without a scrim and the barn doors are open, you want to use this preset. And all you have to do, I already made these presets in Photoshop. All you have to do is load the settings. Just remember the lights you use. Same thing with Coast, with the foil filter, without a foil filter. Because you may light paint without a filter. You may like the exposure, but now you got to use the correct uh, right balance preset for it to work right, the colors to work right. So that's why, you know, I'd recommend using maybe, I do it like, I use a power with filter, then maybe use maybe another, maybe a big piece with filter. So my two filter flashlights. So sometimes I like to use two or three light LED lights at most. There's a lot you can do with, you know, that flashlight. And a lot of times then where I may just aim the Godox, you know, lighting stick at the background. And I like to do it maybe without a scrim, but I can try it with the scrim, but just want to remember how you use the light. If you use with the scrim, use this preset. If you use without a scrim, use this preset. These are all my stands and I have many stands. And this is one way I use concrete blocks. And I'll tell how to use concrete blocks later to take the place of a stand. And these bags, they come with the big boom stands. And these, I haven't checked in a while, but these prices may come down the big boom stands, but I haven't bought one in maybe, gee, three or four, maybe five years. I don't know, but I haven't bought a stand in a while, but I have plenty of stands. 
And these smaller boob stands, rather buy these pouch bags, these nylon bags from a hardware store, and they have all these filled up with stones. You know, I want, and I say this because you might want to use a weight to hold the tripod still so it doesn't move. And this is what I mean by, you know, if you want to do your blank exposure, you want to put a little detail in the shadow and in initial blank exposure, you might want to use a silver thuct or maybe a white. But you could also, you know, the ones with the zippers, you could turn into a white scrim reflector where you would shine the light through the scrim and <clears throat> it would um, soften the light when you light paint. These are snoots. I use these in product photography. McDonald's use these with, you can create like a filter. You can put a big light. You can put tape to make the light really small. You want to make sure that you light pan a 40 or 50 angle. And usually when you use a sloot, you usually have it aiming at a 40 or 50 angle. But there are many ways you could use this. And, all types of still life photography. These are crates where you know you can find one in a store, manager may not want. You can put a light on, you can put things on. They're very sturdy and tough. And the same thing with a bucket. You can put a light on, you can store stuff. And these are my, um, some people, they give wood away. So I grab some wood. This is really strong, sturdy wood. And then at a store, I buy like L brackets at a hardware store, at any hardware store. And I just screw it in with wood screws. Sometimes I use these big tables for like a still life light painting. Or any type of still life. Now, sometimes, you know, I'm trying to incorporate some of the feedback from the IPC critiques where I would use mats and I would try to clone out in Photoshop. But now if I'm doing a wide still life, I have enough so I don't have to, you know, place two mats together. And this makes my job easier in terms of cloning, but you still have to do some, some cloning. This is like furniture shelf wood you could buy at any, you know, maybe a furniture store or a hardware store. These are placed mats where before the wood and the preceding where I would have them close together, but now I just may have one placemat, maybe a bottle of wine, maybe a vertical shot, and I may just need a placemat. Or I can have a placemat at an angle. Sometimes the texture can really help bring out the image and sometimes they don't. Well, sometimes they help bring out the image. I'd recommend maybe a dark color image or like still life. This could, this texture over here, this in, you know, place back can be used differently, but light painting, I like to use like a dark color or a plain, you know, solid color. My backgrounds, a lot of times I like to use a big brown foam board where sometimes I like to use like a background where I won this out of contest. I can't remember the exact date, but I still use it. It's a great background. The one in the, um, this one right here. But you can also use other backgrounds. I recommend a dark color. Now, this is a wood rack. I've used this in many ways. I used to store all my stands, but now I store all my um, foam boards and small reflector boards. But you could also extend the poles out. You could put like a big black background. So I've used this in many ways and I, I like to build things. So now this thing has many holes like this all the way down in case I want to put the pole lower.
these are my black and white cubes. I know some people use apple boxes. I could, but I like to use the cube because I'm not gonna put anything heavy. If you wanna put something heavy, then use an apple box. But usually I just put like a foam board or, or a plexiglass of white or black. This is a great way to create a table. In a, if you have like a small texture to hold stuff. And this where, you know, you could stand this up. You could put the foam board here. You don't have to even use a stand. And they've done this many ways, many times. This is where, you know, I had a stool, a chair where the arm was coming off. I did not want to throw this away where I just saw it off the arms and it's a good stool. And the same thing with the chair. And you can put a light, a table, you can stand on it. And I still have these today and they work. They're very sturdy and strong, sturdy and strong. You can create a small table, you can do a lot with this. The floor rack where if you buy something big like a dishwasher or a piece of furniture, Think twice before throwing it away is I screwed on this piece of wood and you could put up a lamp. So you don't have to worry about touching the ground or you could put a light, you know, a, a good X lighting stick where you have the barn doors closed. You can put up any type of light at a 40, 50 angle to make you, you know, a vignetting background. Expansion poles, and these are CUG clamps where you could send like foam board, scrims. This is a screen made out of stretcher art frames. You put a background. These are my poles where the expandable ones where if you want to have a big background, you could use that rack and extend the poles all the way out. These are one-inch poles. Um, and there are many ways you could use poles in other still life photography. You could maybe attach um, some draft fusion paper in front of the light. Then my black card bees where I can make the light really dark. And this is just made out of stretcher art frames and plastic uh, canvas or canvas paper from office home, office depot. These are my scrims where these are stretcher art frames. This is you could also buy like a frame, like at a Target. You could put some draft fusion paper. And I still have this here and I still use it from time to time. And it makes a cool, you know, black fusion background for something like a glass subject. It's also good for, you know, softening the light of a lead flashlight. <clears throat> and scrims, they could take the place of, you know, a white reflector for softening the light. And these are my two six foot scrims. This is where you have, you know, um, wood from any hardware store. It should cost you four to seven dollars a piece. And I built the frame out of L brackets. You screw in the L brackets, and then you just staple with the with the wood stapler. You just staple on the fusion paper, and you can buy the fusion paper in a roll at an art store, you can also buy it online. But now what I'm noticing in the art stores and they're having a hard time selling the stuff. They're not making it anymore. And I don't know it's because I know our economy is not the best, but it looks like everything's gonna be online. But so when you go to the store, don't be surprised you have to come back and go on your home computer and just buy something online. 
And these big scrims, you could be putting, you know, in front of a light. Also, if there's like a glare, if you're doing a blank exposure, you could soften the light, you could put it in front of the window. And these scrims are great because you don't need a stand. You can just lean on the light. You can just lean on the table. You use without a stand. These are my lenses where I have the 24, 85, 35. A lot of times I just like to use the Canon EF35. It's great for what I do in light painting. And I've been using my 7D for years, but now recently, well, it's been many months, I now use the R6, where I'll talk about that next. And so a lot of times I just like to use my prime lenses for my indoor studio work. For outdoors like wildlife, I use a 7200, 100, 400. But now this is the Canon R6. And very thankful for the Canon converter because I can use all my non F RF lenses. And this is a great, I recommend you the Canon R5, R6, R3. I know, this, I know there are other Canon models coming out. <clears throat> and there's a lot you can do with this camera. And I also have a YouTube on my YouTube channel how I use the Canon R6. So image stabilization with the R6, R5, R3, it's a you have like five or seven levels of image stabilization. A big step up from digital. And so it's still, you know, I think I've been told that it, since mirrorless is so good that you can use it on or off, but I still want to use, you know, without a tripod, turn it on, but with, with the tripod, you turn it off. But in the past, you know, you may have color share problems, but Technology advancing. Even so, I still want to, you know, if you're using it with the tripod, you turn off the stable. But if you're using it without a tripod, you turn it on. Then there's manual focus where I do for light painting, so we're talking about that. I do a quick auto focus and make sure it's sharp. And then I switch to the manual focus. And then from that point on, Everything's in manual focus. So when I light paint, when I click the button, since I'm using mirrorless, you won't even hear the click of the shutter. You won't even hear it. It's a quiet noise. So that's, so I start with an autofocus and then switch to manual and you just remain manual for the, rest of, for the rest of the light painting session. My camera cases, purchase any computer store, however, sir, even a grocery store, maybe even Aldi's. I mean, things are changing. I think, you know, I guess the stores are competing for business and they'll sell anything to stay in business. And I, like the other cases, it's starting in tough, they take a lot of space and they're cheaper. Now, for my in studio work, I use my camera stands and it may have a weight usually, or sometimes, sometimes I can have a weight, but not, but, but then with tripods, I might want to bring a weight and I hope it's not windy when I go out, but I do more indoor studio work than outdoor because outdoor is different, you know, the weather, the wind, the rain, Then I use a tripod, either a tripod or stand. I start with ISO 100. Maybe I can raise it to 200, but without a tripod, I could use a 3200, maybe, you know, a much higher. And I always use a cable release, even for my R6. And I want to make sure that to hold the camera still. This is the cable. 
the release for the 70, but this is the cable for the R6. I think it's Velo, the brand, and this brand is Ars Pixel, but I've been using a lot more of the R6. I've been using this much more than this. So I recommend you experimenting with some releases, use your phone and do that technology today with the mirrorless that could do Wi-Fi, even with some of the later digital, if you're still using digital, but I think that mirrorless is really more people are choosing a mirrorless camera and technology is exploding. So you wanna go forward, not backwards. You see this with the 70, but this only works 70 because you have the connector, but this is also very good. And this will fit in any Canon camera because it's designed for a Canon camera. And it's, you know, two batteries, AAA batteries for the connector and the remote control. And you have maybe 30 channels to work with. It comes with the hour, minute, second formats where you could be like maybe 80 meters plus, but I'm only maybe maybe 15 feet away from the car when the light paints, but there's a lot you can do with this. It's a lot more flexible than the wired remote. And these are my connecting cables. This is called the booster cable. This will go into the computer and this will connect with this cable and this will connect, this will connect with the USB here and the USB-C port will go into the camera. This is for the, you know, R6. And this is for the 7D where, same thing, this is the booster cable, and this is the camera cable where this will boost the signal. So this is, you can buy this in any computer store. And I've used these a lot. I also use um, QVC cables or when I want to attach like a webcam camera when I'm doing like a YouTube live, <coughs> a YouTube live demonstration. <coughs> Again, when you light paints, just for a shiny object, you want to definitely have a scrim in front of the lights. And if you're not using a scrim, you probably want to have a filter. And you want to make sure that you're light painting at a 45 degree angle. Now, you could either use a new gray card for every new LED light. You know, when you take off the filter, it's a new light. A new light, a new LED light, a new different light. Or you could just, and this is what I'm doing from now on, is you can remember the LED light you use in the filter, and you just, you load the preset from Adobe Camera Raw to set the white balance. And you want to go, you know, back and forth. Pendulum motion. You want to emphasize texture, go slower, but for quicker to the opposite. Same thing, only I would definitely want to have, you know, a white screen reflector here and it'll take out the glare. You see how shiny this is? So I don't put a reflector, a white screen reflector, just to come out way to where we were exposed. So we're using, I don't know, the Godex lighting stick, the scrim, so I'd use that preset to correct the white balance. You could also use a new gray card, but why not just take advantage of the power of Adobe Camera Raw, the Adobe Photoshop, the tools they use to um, color correct your images. Now we're going to talk about camera settings where so my camera looks like only it'd be B for bulb and you'd be aperture 16. And we're using the R6 for everything. You could use maybe two cards. You could also have the Wi-Fi. And I recommend, I always want to set my Kelvin. I'll talk about that later. And I always want to use the standard picture because it's the sharpest. And I like the R6 because it has an AF 
intellect or intelligent mode where if you're doing portraits, it, you have good face and subject protection. And I like to just have this on whenever I use the camera. And I always shoot in raw. And for still life regular, I use manual because you use flash a lot. But for live painting, I like to use bold. And, <clears throat> and I could use different shutter speeds and apertures. I also have a channel that talks more about the settings on a YouTube channel. Now for the dry mode, I want to make sure that I'm in single shot mode because I'm doing one exposure at a time. And when I'm light painting, you don't want to do this fast. You want to take your time. You want to think of the shape. You want to think of your filter, the direction of the light for impacts. But I've used these others, like for cell ports, it's a 10 second. They use H plus for one rich photograph. But for light painting, I just want to make sure that I'm using, you know, the single shooting bed because I do, you know, one exposure at a time. In my standard, I feel that's the sharpest. These are all good up here. You could also use custom, like one, two, three. Sometimes I could use them when I'm outdoors. But for light painting, I just use a standard. But some people use monochrome, but for black and white, I do everything in Photoshop. Now for the focus mode, um, I recommend, I like to use the zone focus, either vertical, horizontal, or just a regular autofocus. I feel like it's better that I focus on several parts of the photograph and focus than one part. The record still, you know, on the 70 where there's a 19 point focus, I'd recommend the zone autofocus. Now mirrorless, 153 points, big difference. Um, I recommend, I'd still recommend the autofocus, either vertical zone or just a regular, but people have their preferences. Basically the single point, you just move the cursor you want. Light painting, I wouldn't do that. And the same thing with the small to focus. It's great for macro photography. Then tracking, um, it's great for subject and eye detection, but since I'm light painting, I wanna do the last three either, you know, regular or the vertical or horizontal um, zone auto focus. <clears throat> For the daylight white balance is I set, you know, either use the preset or I just set the Kelvin to what I need. And a lot of times they just set the Kelvin to 5600. I know that mirrorless, it's different with AWS. Some people use AWS for video and they're happy. That's fine. I don't, but you know, some people use even AWS for the regular white balance. But to me, I rather still recommend you know, either daylight preset or just set the Kelvin. And I maybe you could set the white balance with the custom white balance, but if the light changes, well, then you have to do the custom white balance. And that's why I just rather, you know, just set the Kelvin to like 57K. Or if you're using flash, you could use either the, you know, use a preset or just set the Kelvin to 600, 6,000 K. Now for the high speed ISO, noise reduction, I'd still want to disable it, but with mirrorless, um, you may not notice the difference you may, but I mean, how you use my R, my 70 is how many use my R6, because you know, they're all similar in the menu options. Maybe I can use low standard, but a lot of times I just, I just disable it. Long exposure noise reduction is 
sometimes I use auto, sometimes they disable, but in the early DSLRs, you know, you may have a blue color cast problem, but now we're in mirrorless. That problem I don't think exists anymore. And that's why I'd rather use it or disable it or maybe use auto. But I'd rather just disable it with the with you know the proper exposed image. Now the color space is, I always like to start with Adobe RGB. Maybe I could try starting with sRGB, but when you start with RGB, you have over 57 billion colors, and then you convert it to sRGB, well, then you're down to 16, or maybe 17 million colors. And then when I use the sRGB, when I post on the web, I want to make sure I check off the sRGB convert the sRGB profile. If I'm using it in Photoshop, I don't want to check it off so I don't have a color mismatch problem when I open up the image. And there's Pro Photo where it's 281 trillion colors. I know that um, some people maybe suggest starting here, but this people may start to use this because technology is extending, changing, but keep in mind that, you know, the human eye, you know, you recognize two or three, you know, million colors. And that's much less than the 57 billion or 16 or 17 million or 200 trillion, but your eyes can only see so much. I rarely ever use CMYK because I send my stuff to the lab and to make sure that I took off the sRGB profile when I process the image. There's all sorts of stuff you could do with the color space. Cropping ratio, since we're using full frame, you wanna be full because you're using all the pixels, the complete pixel power. But if you use the 1.6, 1 1.1, 4.3, 6 6.9, you're not using the complete pixel power. So I would just use full because you're, you, you're taking advantage of the power of the pixels. The, the others to the left of the full, to the right of the full, they don't do that. They're good for uses, but I recommend you using the full because you know we're using the full frame. Therefore, other exposure bracketing is a lot of times I expose for the highlights, and then it's so I adjust the exposure by a stop. So for the overexposed part that's one stop over, I can work better with the pixels. I know that the R6, you could do maybe 11 frames. I mean, big upgrade from the, you know, 7D. Now for the continuous focusing, continuous AF, where when you first buy your camera and you turn it on, by default, it's enabled. It will always focus whether you push the button or not. So when you want to disable that, and if you don't know how, you can just switch to the manual focus. So I'd recommend disabling the continuous A focus. So when you press the button, the camera will focus. So when you don't press the button, the camera will not focus. And you note that the AF method is it's great for you know eye detection, face detection. But I just recommend you you know you disable it so you'll control the focus all the time. <clears throat> I use one third increments for everything: my shutter, my aperture, my ISO, and the same thing with auto exposure bracketing. Now you could use one half, but I recommend the third. <clears throat> and you have many more bracket shots than three. <clears throat> I think you'd have 11 or nine, but way more than three.
Now for the card recordings, you know, the, the, the media they use to record things on, R6, R5, R3, they come with, you know, two slots for doing two cards where you can do two cards at the same time, switch from card one to card two when it's full. Some people, you know, they recorded both cards for backups. Now, if you're going on an expensive trip or, you know, a hardy at waterfall, you might want to think. You might want to think using two cards, just one for backup. All right, this is being recorded. And then the camera R6, R5, and R6, R3, R5. It works with two cards, I think. Well, the R6 does, where I recommend the card ending at XC because you have much better speed than the HC card. And you have much better space than the HC card. And it's sometimes faster than the HC card, but both cards are good, but there's a big difference between speed, performance, and data storage with the XC card, which is a lot better than the HC ending card. Now I'm going to go to Adobe Camera Raw. We talked about, you know, this where anytime I use a filter or a type, you know, with means with the filter scrim, whatever the soften the light, and without means with no filter, no scrim. Because when you light paint with the filter and then you take off the scrim or filter without it, it's a different light. So we're going to first, you know, and I always want to convert my, you know, these are CR3s with the mirrorless. I always want to convert everything over to the DNG. Easier to work with. So this, depending on the light I would use, I'd open a camera raw. I want to reset the default, I can, but if I want to load the settings, I choose whatever light it was. And all you do is load here, suppose it's for the light, you click open and load the settings. I'll talk about the JPEGs in a bit. Same thing with the silver. I would select all these files. I would, you know, right click, I would open in camera raw. <clears throat> when I reset the default, I can do that. If I want to load the special preset, I think I might have used, I think I might have used the big police. Well, actually, no. And the presets will be in alphabetical order. I think I used the Power BI filter. I click open and then I click done. All you have to do, solo food, <clears throat> and you'll remember the flood flashlight that you used. You know, you select both files, right click Adobe Camera Raw. You want to do Control or Command A. And all you do is remember the LED flashlight. So I have many LED flashlights and I think I might have used, let's see, the big police with the filter. They click open and then I click done. And the symbol here means it has, it has the preset applied. Again, I think that I used, yeah, the Savage with the scrim. So I go to camera raw, goes for a blank natural file. 
I would say load settings. I'd find my, um, since I used the Savage Tool 4 with the scrim, I'll open here, then I click done. So all you have to do is just open up the preset and load the correct, you know, lit flashlight that you used. We'll talk about the master art file a bit. Same thing over here. Um, I got my DNG from Lightroom. Again, I would just select all the files with a certain LED flashlight. Make sure you do control the command day. You want to load the settings, whatever LED, whatever LED flashlight you use with or without a filter, you just click it. Click open, I'm gonna go cancel, then you click done, I'm gonna click cancel. The same thing with the nuts. Click open a camera raw, control A, you wanna select all files. You wanna reset the default, I can do that but then you want to load settings. And I think I might've used, let's see, whatever filter, coast wet filter, means it use it with the foil filter. Click open, then I click done. So then what I do is I get this JPEG, I use the image processor. where I want to load the image processor. <clears throat> now, um, since I already have all the settings applied, I'm not gonna even bother to check this box. I want to make sure that since I'm copying and paste in Photoshop, I do not have that check, I click run. And then I produce this. I produce a folder called JPEG and then you rename the folder. Same thing with the solo nuts. Select both files, tools. Now you can use right room, but I prefer to be in one place. That's why I use image processor. Where save as a JPEG, I'm not gonna bother um, checking off this because I already made the settings. I'm not going to check off convert profile to sRGB. Then click run. Then you want to deal with fruit. This is for five JPEGs. You select all the JPEGs, but since we're only selecting two, we already did that. Oops. And light painting can be tedious. So, patience is a virtue. Image processor. So since I already made the settings over here, is the, from the preset, we don't have to apply settings. And then you have make sure you don't have this checked since you'd be copying and pasting in Photoshop and then click run. And you produce a photo called JPEG and you can rename it. That's what I do, you know. Um, for every folder here, wine, solid fruit, the background, I'll use a, you know, Godex lighting stick. You could use a gray card, but you could also use a, you know, a preset in Adobe Camera Raw. Now I'm going to do new Photoshop. I'm going to go into Adobe Photoshop. Yeah. So I'm going to open up that um, I'm going to start from over here. Okay. 
I'm gonna go to my DNG folder because I converted it with the DNG converter. Make my screen smaller. There's actions for everything. I'm gonna open up a JPEG. And so, um, okay. So what I'm gonna do, So when I, so this is called the blank exposure to start with. Then, and this is another thing I did in the end, but and this is the first part of the action where all you do is, you know, make a base layer. You just make it a black layer where You drag the black slider all the way to left. And that's all you do. Maybe if you need to add light, you can add a little light. All right. Make it better. But then now it's a power of Adobe Photoshop. So this is really a JPEG. I would open up a JPEG. I'd make a selection with the lasso tool, and maybe I could oh. use. Quick selection, I can do a lot of stuff here. A lot of times I just use a lasso tool, make a selection. I do control command C, and then I come over here. And then when I do this, when I do paste, when I paste in place, which is edit, paste in place, because what I'm doing is, wherever this is in this photograph, it will paste in place in this master object. And then after I do that, you know, paste in place, and then I want to set the current blend mode to light every time. And then the brush. Want to be, you want to have the flow around, you know, 15. Or maybe you could have, One seventeen, eighteen. In each nostril. Excuse? So then I got my brush, a soft brown brush, my brush settings, where the hardness is zero, I'm not worried about the space, it doesn't concern me. So, and every time I do that, I would open up a JPEG, I run this action, and then blend light and blend mode, and I get my brush, and I make my brush smaller by pushing, you know, the left French brace key. Two sprays. Three times a day. Okay. Yeah, decrease. And then the other, you use the right French key. And I would just paint it. Now, suppose I paint too much out here. Then, you know, white reveals black hides. You hide away what you don't want to see. When you switch to the white, you reveal what you want to see. Same thing over here. I'd run that action and then blend lighten mode. And the first step is, okay. first part of the action is, whoops, paste, paste into place because wherever this is in a photograph, it's gonna appear in this master image file.
This is the fruit. I do. The, I run this action. So every everything. Now, when I light paint the backgrounds, you definitely want to have a very low flow, like maybe five percent, and you want to use maybe a really wide brush. You want a light paint, but you want a light paint so faint. They won't even notice it. So you light paint. And so what I did was I put all these layers in a group, select all layers and I would just, you know, Suppose you were 16 layers, you would just do um, new group from layers. And that's how I got this. So then there's an action for this and I'll talk about my actions. Oops. There are many actions here. MFP's me, Michael Francis Pucciarelli. Let me see, I have a white signature. I have actions for everything. Anytime I delete an action, I'll just throw it in the trash. And sometimes when you light paint, you know, suppose you don't like something. Suppose you don't like this. You just do it again. You want to think layers when you light paint. Sometimes I could use, you know, like a Gaussian burr in a smart object to get the effect that I like. Not going to save any changes. Oops, let's see. I'll we'll open another file. Where, um, I mean, that Well, this is the first action where I run the action and make a, I'm gonna collapse this folder. I would just make this layer I run this action. I'm gonna run the action. All it is is this. You just, you know, I'll do control Z, control Z. You just drag it over here to make it black. And these are actions from other filters I do in the end. Oh, here's the base, sorry. So I could throw this in the 
And anytime you want to chuck a layer, there. I think we do is we just, you know, if you want to add in lights, but I don't, so I just drag the dark all the way to the left. Then, is where I just, you know, I'd open up a JPEG, I would select what I want to see, then I run this action and I do, you know, edit, paste in place. And then I always want to end in the light and blend mode. And then I would, you know, I'm going to check my brush settings. I'm going to be at zero hardness. My word about the spacing, soft brush. And since I'm not light painting at backgrounds, about 1715. And make sure I'm on the layer mask. You want to be painting white on a black layer mask. And you just paint. Now, suppose I paint too much. Then you just push the X, see how they change the black? You hide what you don't want to see. And you could even do it, you know. See this? Too much black. So what I would do, through the black. But now I want to switch it to white. Same thing. I make it open up a JPEG. I make a selection. And I just run the paste action. So all this, I'm always ending up in the light and blend mode. And these are all separate JPEGs. Then have this all in a group. Suppose this were 15 layers. I would just if I want to affect all this, you know, the exposure at once. <clears throat> I would do um, new group from layers. And that's how I get this group over here. Now I'm going to talk about these settings where I run multiple actions, one right after the other. Sometimes, you know, I could use, you know, let's see. I'm going to bring my things. Where, where I use actions, where I, I call other actions, they'll call them the speckle, they'll send scratches, and then sharp mask and fade. Where the speckle, there's no problem for this. And then dust and scratches, whoops. I'm under the noise filter category, the dust and scratches. I have it at 1.3. Then the in sharp mask. I just click OK. I have it at 200. And I want to make sure he's 1.0 because I want to affect the pixel. Someone say something? And I want to have the threshold at seven. So it says fade where fade on sharp mask, where I would probably change it to limosity for gray for contrast. The same thing over here. All I use a dozen scratches, the speckle, and then the filter, 
I would use a high pass and I have it set at 10. I'm going to use something else too. I'm trying to. Sometimes I like to use action in groups. Talk about this frame later. Yeah, and this is another one where sometimes I just run the last one sharpen, but I don't do it with the fade. I'm gonna close out of this. I'm gonna put another one where I'm gonna go up. I'm using up air to go up. Where you know the same process where my screen okay. so this would be the base layer where. Just make it dark by a drag the dark slider all the way to the left. And then I run that, you know, action, which was at 17. And every time I do that, I, you know, I would edit paste special, paste in place. So I paste in place and then the blend with the light. So these are all separate JPEGs. I copy what I want to use. And this, where if I want to do the frame, But do the actions where I call this action, this action calls this action, and then this action calls this action, and it calls the black, because the frame is black, but the other parts are white. So I have actions. So when I do this, I use actions and I call their actions to get the effect that I like. To have a condition where if it's a big width, if it's landscape, I call this action. If it's not, I call the other action. And so what I do, so the longest side is only going to be 4,000 pixels. So if the height were longest, it'd be 4,000 and the width would be a different number. And they use 300 pixels per inch. I use an action for that. Then, when I want to do an export, 
I can also have an action for, you know, I have an action for like, if I want to save a Photoshop, I'm gonna make my screen, my action screen smaller. I would just, you know, I could save as a Photoshop. I could save as a, anywhere I like. I can also export, I wanna save for the web. You know, quality 100. Since I'm gonna be posting a web, I'm gonna make sure I have this checked. I have my dimensions and I click, you know, when I click save, I save it where I want. I have to locate it. The next time I use action, they'll save it where I last used it. You can also use the menu. Oops. You can also use it up here too, but sometimes I just want to use um, actions because it's quicker. I do a quick export. Same thing. Review my export preferences. Quality should be 10. Now it has my copyright information. Since I'm posting a web, I want to make sure this is checked. And it asks me every time where I want to export it. I click OK. So So now I'm going to finish the program by the last part. I don't see any questions in the chat. I want to just now I just want to pause for any questions about anything I said. Okay, it looks like they're no. So now I just want to quickly talk about the screenshots in case anything's confusing. First, I want to talk about Adobe Camera Raw and then Photoshop. So for light painting, the only thing I want to do is get the white bounce selector, select the white bounce. And this is all done under presets. I don't want to touch, you know, I don't want to affect the shadows or highlights in any way because you're going to need that raw base file to help you light paints. But for other photography, I could increase the texture clarity, increase the exposure. You know, but the highlights and shadows determine the image. So I want to leave everything else alone. The only thing I want to do is this is all done under presets, depending on the LED flashlight with or without the filter. Some people can make an S curve, but in light painting, I don't want to touch this. And I've been told it's better just to leave this part alone. Now for sharpening, you know, some people can, you know, sharpen 150, 50 for noise reduction, color noise reduction, 32, but you're better off just sharpening at the ends, including light painting. And you used to use like at least 140, portraits 120, but you know what? I don't want to touch this section when I do anything. But if I want to take some noise out, I want to make sure that I zoom to two or 300% and just Take out the block spots, but I don't touch this area. And make sure that you click and fit and view when you're done so you get the regular screen size. Optics. Um, 
Sometimes in my painting, I don't want to touch this, but other photography I do. I remove chromatic aberration. You correct any color problem to the edges. And if the lens profile, in light rain, I don't use this, but in other photography, I just check this. But in the lens profile, it just shows you the lens that you're using. Now, a lot of times for geometry distortion, just click the A. If you have the vertical, I wrote, I'd like to do that in Photoshop, but I feel that's a better thing to do. But you just click the A for the auto. It's an accurate way, it's the quickest way. And it helps me get my job done sooner. Now, sometimes you need to put vignetting. That's where you want to get the effects. <coughs> You can do this at the end, maybe. <laughs> All right. Oh. Then you just click on the vignetting. Don't worry about the number. Look at the photograph and make it look natural. You'll know if you did too much. And there's photoshops. Now, when I do, Sometimes I do HDR, I want to run this action. I do auto align and auto blend. It happens one action right off the other. But I don't do this in Lightroom. I mean, I mean, I'm light painting. Because I'm working with, you know, one exposure from done with the lead flashlight, probably and definitely with the filter, so I get the good lighting. Sometimes I can use the auto features and Auto tone, auto contrast, auto color. Sometimes you can use the image in right, have them in groups. It does a certain step and it calls another action. This action will call this action. So, you know, basically I have a save in Photoshop. It saves it wherever I want and navigate it. And the next time I use it, it goes to the correct um, location. Dodge and burn. I don't use any of this in light painting, but other photography I do where I burn with the luminosity blend mode, I dodge with the screen blend mode. And I have a, other actions for other signatures and level adjustments. Now, sometimes I do use this in the end in light painting where I call an action, which this happens, does scratches, then this, and then this, where the high pass filter. My frame, I call this action. This happens, then I call this action. Um, this happens, and then this action, this happens. And I come back over here and I finish everything and have a condition, depending on the file size. Here's my image settings look like after easy action where the longest side is 4,000. So it's a width in this case, but it's 300 pixels per inch. For sharpening, I like to use maybe 200 at most. And I want to focus on one pixel and the thresholds between six and seven. It's good for contrast. And for the backgrounds is where I can call this speckle that on scratches. And for the last one, Unsharp mask, you want to make sure that your luminosity blend mode. Then you do the fade. Again, the speckle, another way to use background actions. And then when I want to, you know, file preferences for JPEG is where 
quality 100. You know, I want to convert to sRGB because I'm saving to the web. Quick export. Same similar steps. But I shall remember the last time you used the action, the location. This is in Lightroom where I was just, you know, making a selection. I was pacing in place. And then I always end up in a light and blend mode. And I talked about my brush settings. The frequency separation, this is for cloning. And the low frequency is for doing a selection using a filter. High frequency is up, you know, the linear light and the low is a regular blend mode. And this is using the other. It's the high pass. You can just change this to a few more pixels if you like. A block and white actions. Where you have channels, I like to use a mixture channel where you zero out the green, zero out the blue, zero out the red. Sometimes you can just use many ways you can do black and white with the gradient map using the blend mode of color, the threshold blend mode of color, For the black and white, you negative out the saturation and vibrance, and you can use a lightness for contrast. And you can use the vibrance. And sometimes I like to use a combination one where I do portraits where I run one of these, and then with this, and I make some simple adjustments. My workspace looks like, the layers, the tabs, photograph, my brushes. This is my photography groups. Some are Facebook. My face, my still life, I was almost 2,000 members. You're welcome to join. My architect one is growing, so is my others. And some I run with people, some I run by myself. In my meetup clubs. My Facebook, my business links, Instagram, I'm, I'm there a lot. My LinkedIn, Twitter, I found our website, my portfolio is here. Then my YouTube. This is my YouTube. There's about, you know, 51 subscribers where my playlist, I have a section on equipment and still life and light painting. I have light painting webinars, but it's photo shop. I have black plexiglass software only, and also white plexiglass. And if you have any questions, you could, you know, email me at mpucciarelli, art here at gmail.com, or you can communicate via Instagram, Facebook, email, like I gave you, and Twitter and LinkedIn, or my contact forms on this side of this site. So thank you for listening this webinar on light painting, my latest. So if you're interested in more tutorials and webinars like this, maybe consider liking and subscribing to my YouTube channel. You know, still like photography by Capucciarelli. Thank you for listening and watching this webinar.